This is Global Order. I'm Hindul Sen Gupta. I'm delighted that Vivek from Triple S Defense has joined me. He's the founder of one of India's pioneering indigenous defense manufacturing companies. And I invited him to have a conversation with me today because of a long series of tweets he wrote yesterday, essentially saying that India has just placed another enormous uh, order in buying US rifles or US made rifles for the Indian army. And perhaps that order or similar orders could be better used by Indian indigenous manufacturers who are trying to build an entire indigenous capability. Remember, no nation, certainly not the size of India, can ever hope to be truly sovereign if we do not make our own armaments. I'm also really delighted because on this platform, we usually get a whole range of academics and uh, you know military generals and uh, diplomats and all kinds of other peoples and writers uh, from around the world. But this is one of the rare instances to talk to somebody who's really in the arms manufacturing business, especially in India, which is really trying to boost indigenous manufacturing. Thank you for your time. Thank you for Thank having me. Vivek, let's begin with some of the arguments you were making uh, in your series of tweets. The big thing you mentioned was that India has placed a big order for tens of thousands of uh, rifles. I think 73,000 is the number that you quoted. And some of that effort, some of that financial effort, some of that financial push could have easily gone to indigenous manufacturers. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your argument. So my argument was basically predicated on the fact that uh, five or six years back when the first order for the 6716 was placed and that was through an emergency procurement, things were very different. We really did not have an indigenous arms manufacturing establishment in India besides whatever was there in the government control space. Private sector was just kind of, you know, learning the ropes it was coming to speed with uh you know with with um with the ideas of arms manufacturing at that point in time um when i actually put out the tweet i really did not put out the tweet purely on behalf of uh, our company triple s defense and by the way just to clarify i'm, I'm one of the co-founders not the founder uh, now the uh the 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 whole uh, logic that after having bought the first series of, let's say, 73,000 rifles, um, we did not have the foresight to kind of put in investments of time um, and effort, not as much capital, but time and effort to identify Indian companies, not just one company, it's not about us. You could have identified maybe three or four companies who had the capabilities, who had the um, you know, the, the wherewithal to put out uh, 7.62 by 51 uh, assault rifle. Um, that is what I'm basically questioning here. And, and, and there, there is a reason why I'm doing this as well. Um, procurements are one thing, but global armies are actually moving away from pure procurements to identifying ways and means in which they can have the sustenance of armed supplies over several decades. Uh, Classic examples would be several European countries in the US who put out solicitations stating, you know what, this is what I need out of a rifle. This is what I need to comply with. These are the conditions. Uh, you know, these are the missions uh, that would be undertaken by this particular weapon system. They put in a project management office or maybe uh, an office which is accountable for taking that particular rifle through its paces. And then they see which one of those companies which has actually put out a rifle or any other weapon system uh, is best positioned to take it into production, right? Now, something of that sort is what I believe is needed for this country going forward. And the reason is very simple. Uh, indigenization is not something that you, you know, you click a button and there from the next day onwards, you know, you start substantial indigenization. Companies actually have to put effort into R&D. They've got to build up a talent pool to design and manufacture weapon systems. They need to have support from the forces. And I should be honest with you, the Indian Army is a brilliant uh, fighting force. It's technically very competent. It also has people who are supportive and a lot of people who are supportive of indigenization efforts. But yet, you know, it is important that we move towards those kind of efforts as against purely trying to say, what is it that I can buy? 
right? Um, because what you can buy today may not be what will be supporting you for the next decade. Uh, armies do not essentially uh, establish the vision based upon uh, today's criteria. I mean, tomorrow, the war theater that you might be fighting in would be uh, very different. It could also be that your enemy is moving two paces ahead of you. And so what you've actually decided to buy today uh, might work fine today, but may not work fine, let's say, a decade from now. And might not, might not work in one theater, would work fine in another theater. Classic examples could be, you know, <laughs> uh, you bought the 762 by 51 uh, assault rifle. I'm making it a little simpler, right? Uh, the reason why you bought the 762 by 51 assault rifle is because there was a certain doctrine that said that the 5.56 round uh, or maybe the incest round, which the Indian Army was using for several years, did not have stopping power. Um, fine, that's a, that's a logic. And your objective was to kind of kill and not injure. Um, logic holds true. But is it possible for, um, for, for, for an army to kind of say that that doctrine is the only doctrine? It may not necessarily be the case. Uh, you require weapons which are lighter. You require uh, ammo carrying capacity. You should be able to put more rounds downrange. The 7.62 by 51 is one of those rounds which is a brute of a round. It actually causes more recoil. Uh, it is more unwieldy to use relative to a lot of other rifles. So whilst it has its own positioning, it has its own requirement in the armed forces, it's not the one-stop solution for a lot of things. Now, some of these doctrines need to be assessed, need to be debated. And I think it would have been great, and I still believe it is good for the armed forces to start thinking about solicitation to the Indian defense manufacturers because it helps Indian manufacturers come up to speed with what the Indian Army wants. It helps the Indian Army to understand what's available. And instead of just going out and buying something off the shelf, it gets something which can be sustained in terms of both supplies as also modernization and upgrades over a period of a much longer timeline, maybe several decades. So that was my whole and sole position. Let me ask you, in, in a sense, we've been talking about defense indigenization more actively, at least more loudly, uh, in the last several years. But there have been, you know, this entire saga has many failures, you know, helicopters that we tried to build, tanks we tried to build, some were successes, many were failures, government organizations and institutions tried to build them, there were massive delays. And now, of course, we're really pushing this idea that the private sector will do it. Now, in the private sector also, from what I understand, there are only one or two companies like yours which are purely indigenous, by which I mean who are really building weapons from the scratch, which will be totally Indian weapons. There are other companies who, which may be Indian companies, but they are JVs with other foreign companies. And essentially, the only thing they will do in India is perhaps assemble. There is no real technology uh, insertions or input or building up technology uh, you know, uh, that you would own and completely uh, contain within your sort of uh, sovereign uh, territory in, in the, those scenarios. Now, there are only a couple of those companies that you know do the kind of work that you do. What has been your experience? Talk to us a little bit, because I, th I don't think a lot of people who might be watching this don't even know. First, they wouldn't have even heard of your uh, company uh, until, you know, perhaps many people saw your tweets. Talk to us a little bit about what does your company do? When did you start? What are the challenges and opportunities that you faced? And what would help you really become, get scale and become a world leader at what you do? You know, this is a very interesting question. And <clears throat> that's a whole new story. But I love to kind of talk about this story. Uh, back in 2017, when we decided to get into this space, we were no different from uh, a lot of other people who thought that this is a very, very diff difficult end of a... Let me stop you for a moment. How, how did you decide to get into this space? What is your background and what is your ba the, what, the background of your co-founder? Well, I'm an investment banker, uh, a private equity fund guy, spent a lot of time raising capital, spent a lot of time, time putting in money, uh, you know, getting businesses off the ground, uh, supporting businesses through certain crunch growth stages. Uh, that That's exactly what my background is. My co-founder, uh, Dinesh, who's the chief technology officer of the company, is someone who spent a lot of time in uh, in, in, in technology firms. Both of us have spent time in uh, very, very technology-driven enterprises like General Electric. Uh, Satish, who is the 
managing director of the company is the third generation promoter of the Slum Shule and some of our Springs group, which is what I said, the largest maker of Springs in this country, and also the, uh, the main promoter. Now, um, the, the reason why we kind of got into defense was that defense was an area which gave us a lot of synergies with the core business. Core business was really about, uh, you know, understanding, um, you know, uh, metallurgy. Uh, we were in the auto component space, making springs. You don't generally see springs failing you. That's because they're not supposed to be failing, right? So you kind of work on, um, on, 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 parts and components and, and, and components where failure is definitely not an option. Uh, you built up scale, multiple factories, right? And so there was an inherent understanding of many of these inside the company. Uh, defense was at that point in time opening up in the sense that the government was very serious about getting in the private sector into defense manufacturing. Uh, it made a lot of sense for us to kind of get into defense per se, but then the question was what are the areas that would actually make sense? Small arms and ammunition, both of these were areas which made a lot of sense because we had a little bit of a background in not exactly making those full weapons, but understanding certain parts and components of the weapons. Now, back in 2017, um, it, it was common for most people to think that uh, making weapons and small arms and uh, you know similar kind of equipment is a very, very difficult task. Uh, I don't think we were at that point in time any different in the sense that uh, we did actually go out and then actively uh, search for partners who might help us. But there was a very quick understanding that we had. And the understanding was that the rest of the world is very happy to give you a transfer of technology. And transfer of technology for them is actually selling components to you and enabling you to kind of do an assembly in your country. Uh, maybe they part with drawings, but then there is always something very critical in the sustenance of a business or a product. And that is to kind of know why not know how no why comes in because you actually do things experiment do research fail get back on the horse and try back again to make it a success uh, we realized very quickly that the lack of access to a no why coming in because of a very simple technology transfer kind of a, uh, you know program uh, would not be good for us in the long term that was a calculated decision of ours it was also a calculated decision of ours at that point in time that in the defense space, the armed forces are actually looking for commitment from the industry. Uh, there were always people wanting to get contracts and then doing something about it on the ground. We decided to kind of not put the cart before the horse. We decided to kind of go out there, show our commitments, which is why as of today, we are the only company which has proprietary designs. We have manufacturing technology on all of our weapon systems. We started off back in 2018 by just focusing on the sniper rifles because, uh, again, it was a little bit of a uh, gutsy decision of ours to kind of aim for the Formula One of weapon systems. Sniper rifles are fairly complex equipment. Uh, they demand substantially high levels of performance. Uh, that also helped us because the kind of learnings that we had were working on the high performance systems translated into a very, very good understanding of what would work uh, for the assault rifles as in when we started building those assault rifles. Now, uh, a, a key point is this, right? This is not rocket science. Let me be very honest with you. Working on small arms is really not rocket science. Uh, but what definitely is important is for you to know <coughs> how the designs that you work on can actually translate into limited series production and thereafter move into full-on production because there's a, substan there's a substantial difference between making one weapon and making hundreds of weapons and making all of them perform the same way, which is what we did thereafter. So first part was working on designs. The second part was trying to kind of translate those designs into production series of weapons. The next part was going in and aggressively indigenizing those because uh, the longer that you are dependent upon foreign companies or foreign suppliers for certain parts and, uh, uh, and, and the longer that you will always be beholden to that particular supply chain. Um, for example, I mean, there are a lot of companies which start by doing assemblies. The foreign partner really does not want you to learn the tricks of the trade. And you don't learn the tricks of the trade because you don't have to learn the tricks of the trade. We learned the tricks of the trades. So today we've actually managed to get indigenization up to almost about 100% in certain weapons. 
almost close to 100 percent and a few other weapons and i think that is something that uh uh you know that that evolves over a period of time for us it's almost taken us about seven years uh there is a tipping point somewhere along the way where the lessons you've learned basically have been ingrained into the dna of the company and the next round of evolution the next round of R&D basically takes much lesser time. So that's where we are at this point in time. We've invested a lot of capital. We pretty much have everything inside uh, you know, our house, everything from manufacturing of, uh, of the barrel to manufacturing of the operating systems to manufacturing of uh, the ergonomic parts. Uh, we do our own designs. We do our own testing in-house. Uh, we do our own simulations in some cases. We not only make rifles, we've also moved on to manufacturing uh, certain other accessories which are critical in current missions, for example, suppressors. These are silencers which kind of work along with sniper rifles and assault rifles as well. Uh, we've we've gone global at this point in time, managed to kind of get our systems inducted into a foreign force. We intend to, in the next few years, also be in the US market, uh, initially with certain products and then gradually kind of uh, pushing in certain other products as well. Uh, besides, the U.S. also kind of want to be in certain other military markets where we believe that geopolitically, uh, you know, being able to uh, sell them weapons, support them on arms and ammunition can become a very critical element of India's foreign policy. So does that answer your question? Yeah, that's very really comprehensive. Me? I have one or two questions to ask you. That sounds like a fascinating journey from being an investment banker to, you know, building this entire company getting into weapons manufacturing. Talk to me a little bit about some of the pushbacks that have come to the arguments you made yesterday. Now, it is true that you guys are one of the few people who are you know, doing near 100% completely indigenous manufacturing of these assault rifles and other weaponry. Uh, but the, as far as orders are concerned, uh, there has been a pushback that, well, an army cannot decide to give tens and thousands of its soldiers one kind of weapon, and then one day decide, even while those people are using that weapon, get a new set or a new weapon for another set of people, and they're all going to go, you know, if, if such a moment comes into the battlefield together, carrying different weapons. That makes no sense. And therefore, it's tough, much that the Indian Army might want to, and even you said that there are people who really want to push indigenization. It's tough to do, you know, in a near short term, should we say? Well, you know, that's again an argument which, okay, all through in every business, you have certain arguments which gather traction. They become easy, you know, selling points. Uh, you dig a little deeper in there and then you're very easily able to figure out that those points may not actually hold much water. So this is one of those arguments. Uh, let me kind of give you um, an example, right? Uh, let's talk about some of the uh, largest armies with the most modern technologies, right? And I'm talking small arms for now. Uh, the U.S. Uh, they screwed up in the Vietnam War, managed to make some changes to the weapons. They still carry the M4, right? Uh, most of the fighting force, the infantry fighting force, carries the M4. Uh, yes, they've had issues with the M4 in Afghanistan. They managed to kind of not change the whole rifle, but what they did was they kind of uh, worked along with their asymmetric warfare group, changed certain elements of ammunition, uh, changed certain mission tactics, uh, went back in um, to kind of go against the enemy. The enemy was using what? The enemy was using the standard AK-47, using the 5.45 by 39, or in some cases, a 7.62 by 39 uh, weapon of sorts. Uh, they have the M4. They also have the M16, which is a 7.62 by 50. They have multiple weapons uh, and uh, groups. Uh, they have the HK416, uh, which is used by the Navy SEALs. Uh, they have, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a bell-fed um, uh, LMG, which is chambered for the 7.62 by 51, and multiple other LMGs that have come into play in their uh, in their arsenal. Uh, they're slowly starting to move, slowly. That's the point I'm trying to make here. They're slowly starting to move towards an intermediate cartridge. It's not a one-time decision. It's a decision that they've taken that over a period of several decades, or maybe more, they will move towards an intermediate cartridge, which is somewhere between a light cartridge and a heavy cartridge, and possibly has the same stopping power as a heavier cartridge. Why are they doing that? It's because of the lessons of war. They've gone into war, and they probably have learned their lessons. 
we are trying to kind of learn the lessons which those people have learned but we are trying to kind of you know juxtapose those lessons straight off that that's the environment that you are in you've got to base your doctrines on this on this very important factor that tomorrow if you got where what how does your supply chain work how dynamic is it at that point in time right now the americans have the capability and now people even argue by saying the americans have got a very large pool of ammunition lots of weapons a very strong arms industry they can do what they wish to do but i state a simple point here it's not that you need to have one single round of ammunition or one single weapon which everyone's got to use if that is the case and you would never evolve right you should have the capabilities but that does not mean that we in india desire that we will have the 7.62 by 51 we will have the ak203 which is based on the 7.62 by 39 we'll have the 7.62 by 51 light machine gun we'll have a 0.33 lapua magnum uh, you know sniper rifle and that would be the end of it and i don't believe that uh, in all fairness would be the end of it because five years down the line uh, you could have uh, people wanting a uh, a much stronger round for example a 338 norma to be functioning along with your machine guns you might actually want to hold the 5.56 which today a lot of people would say doesn't pack a punch you might actually want to change the ammunition and because it's a light round you can actually carry more of that when you go into battle you can sell more you can send more you know uh, ammunition down range a uh, heavier cartridge like the 7.62 by 51 might give you accuracy but it's a lot of things to carry and if you are operating in let's say mountains and you are operating in areas with low oxygen that becomes much more difficult uh you know situations where you kind of dropping in people uh parachute drops and all of that stuff it's a little more cumbersome in those kind of situations on the other side the ak203 uh the whole world finds this nice story that the ak is the most reliable weapon you can dump it into the ground and pick it up 20 years down the line it will still fire good story no problems doesn't happen all the time i've seen ak's fail the mud test in front of me i've seen the ak's fail very elementary and rudimentary tests in front of me so that's not all the time true it's a story that was invented by the russians because the 7.62 by 39 was an innately inaccurate weapon they had to sell ruggedization they had to sell the idea that their, their weapon was more reliable and they invented the story partly true not wholly true right but we fall for those traps and being an arms manufacturer today we understand several of those traps what we trying to do is we trying to kind of build up the narrative here that what is right for india is not what the world tells is right for india it is neither what you believe has been you know right for india in the past what we need is an evolutionary framework something which is dynamic something which does not say go by what is available today because you need something today right and fine let's assume here that you still went out and bought something today you signed uh, you know with the ak203 you have a requirement for let's say 600000 rifles to be delivered in the course of the next 10 years this agreement was signed back in the year i think 2019 or something like that it was all good intentions let's say it was all good intentions but did anybody imagine geopolitical uh, twists like what we've seen in the course of the last 3 4 years of russia fighting a war and not having the capability to supply the rest of the world in fact the rest of the world was being supplied by russia do you think that's going to happen in the future i don't think so i might even be uh, inclined to believe today that what we're seeing is the beginning of a long drawn out conflict across zones and regions and in those kind of situations it is fair for every army every a uh, geopolitical strategist to start asking this question how is it that i for the next 10 years or maybe more preserve the element of self reliance without compromising on the ability to go hammer and tongs at the enemy whilst being aware of what the enemy is doing and being one step or maybe two steps ahead of him and there's also a question i mean since you mentioned russia vivek that you know if you get into long protracted conflicts it's not just the weapons you go into fighting with in the beginning it's also the ability you will lose vast amounts of weaponry which is exactly what's happening to russia you need that back end supply chain 
to keep manufacturing vast amounts of them, uh, you know, and keep supplying them to your troops. And you could come to a situation, and India has actually faced this before, that your suppliers, your regular suppliers, may have geostrategic, uh, you know, notions or ideas which are different from yours, and they may withhold certain technologies or even replenishments at a crucial moment. I don't think a lot of people think about this. You're absolutely right. I can cite examples for you, and these are not these are not examples which are of the public domain. I won't just mention the guns. That's it. We we bought foreign guns. Some of those foreign guns uh, have come to the end of their warranty periods. Uh, we've seen breakages. We've seen breakages in operating parts. We've seen breakages in very small parts, something as small as a pin, right? Something which is as small as a spring. But those are foreign weapons. You don't have Indian guys who can actually manufacture to those. We've been approached by forces to come down and then say, can you help us out with those small parts? What, what is it that I have in the overall uh, scheme of things to do this work for them? It is just pure national security awareness and the fact that if those weapons are there and they're foreign weapons, and even though I may have nothing to do with those weapons, it is still somebody who is part of my family who's going out there in uniform and, you know, you know, facing up to the enemy. So we do some of that stuff. It also helps us to learn how those guys preserve their advantages. Now, if you have to kind of go back to a foreign company and say, hey, listen, I'm seeing substantial wear and tear in this particular part. He's going to charge you an arm and a leg, and sometimes he may never even be able to supply you because he's too busy doing other stuff. Right? Today, XYZ might have India as a prime customer. Tomorrow, India may not anymore be a prime customer. It might become the government of Lithuania or Latvia. Right? At that point in time, somebody going in there and saying, I need replacement parts and I need support from you guys to maintain some of these weapons. It's when you see war and you start throwing 10,000 rounds down the barrel that you see serious wear and tear. When you don't fire your uh, weapons, on a daily basis, and you fire them, let's say, once in a blue moon, you don't see much of wear and tear. We've seen wear and tear despite that in some foreign weapons. Another case in point, bought a beautiful weapon. You've started having issues on cycling uh, of the board. Uh, just one problem. You don't have an NMRO that the company set up for you in India, which means to say that every time you're having those issues, and let's say five or six of those weapons have issues, you've got to send the entire weapon back to the home country for them to kind of do any form of maintenance. What does that do? It basically takes away your ability to train. It takes away ability in times of war to put out your best people against the enemy. I believe that indigenous construction of weapons, indigenous design of weapons and the ability to kind of mass produce them is a critical element. The Indian army has received support so far from the government sector, there was just one issue in all of this. The government sector did not do justice to their whole role. And everybody knows this. I don't believe there is anyone who says, no, a government did the best it could do. I mean, the ordnance factories failed in multiple instances. The private sector, and that's a point I mentioned in my tweet yesterday, as far as pride is concerned, we lost a lot of the pride by being uh, developers of substandard weapon systems for years together. We're trying to build back that pride. At this point in time, going forward, especially it is important that the vision comes back in to say, fine, if there are issues that we will face on the supply chain, if there are issues that we will face on maintenance, how are we going to be solving that? Because it is not, it is definitely not, uh, you know, prudent to believe at this point in time that the guys that you buy from today, two years after the warranty is over, will continue to support you. There are also instances of companies who have openly said we will not supply to India because of the fact that we are involved in human rights violations in Kashmir. What do you say to those companies? Do you go back to them with a the begging bowl? What about your self-esteem as a country? Right? These are all issues which we have contended with. The army has contended with. The army knows about this. Our armed forces are very, very understanding of this. In fact, I have only one point to say. I believe there are more people in the armed forces who support indigenization than ever before. Which is also the reason why I put out this tweet, because it is much better for us to kind of make awareness be critical at such points in time when the cognizance of this particular element of national security is high, not when it is low.
I want to pick up on one thing that you just mentioned, Vivek, which is the role of ideology in arms supplies. We are, I mean, undoubtedly, we are getting more and more into an ideological world. We're in a woke world where large companies, too, are consistently getting affected by this. And, you know, if you have the wrong person in the wrong, uh, you know, position in some company, they might take you know, ideological positions in places which may be really detrimental for many countries, certainly India, there could be misrepresentations made by vested interest to certain quarters, who, which represented then as an ideological position just to deny India a rising power, the weapons it needs. All of this needs to be factored in step by step, uh, almost, you know, as we do war gaming. Do you think this kind of thinking exists or is happening at a large scale in India? Well, I, I'm sure about the fact that there are people in the armed forces who are aware of this. I'm absolutely sure about the fact that there are a lot of people in the armed forces who would like to do something about this. But I'm not so sure as to whether there are people in the armed forces who are tasked with ensuring that that situation does not happen to us again. Right? Uh, and why do I say that? I only say that because of the fact that I don't have complete information. If I had information, then I would have definitely either, you know, kept it confidential because it was confidential, or I would have told this because there is nothing which I would want to know mo more than the ways and means in which the government of the army is supporting industry. I definitely believe we are much ahead than where we were back in 2016 and 2017 in terms of indigenization, in terms of the idea of Atman Nirbhar Bharat. But it doesn't mean that we should not talk about where we have uh, weaknesses today. It is important that we talk about the weaknesses and figure out how we can kind of stop those weaknesses from becoming something that burden us tomorrow. Now, to your particular issue. I have two questions to ask here. There is substantial polarization in this world. Ideologies drive in some cases. In some cases, it is pure geopolitical self-interest. Right? Um, is there a way in which we can insulate ourselves from someone tomorrow who denies us access to technology which is desperately needed. That's the first question, right? And we'd say, yeah, I think we can. But I believe that's all nothing but, you know, talk. Because if you've realized very recently, the United States actually managed to deny Israel access to guide bombs. This is a relationship which has been holding... Uh, you know, loyal for goddamn decades. And finally, one time, unbelievably so, we had the Americans denying this particular technology to the Israelis. The Israelis pivoted. The Israelis decided at this point in time that we're going to be putting in more money into certain technologies that we do not have and where we are beholden to the United States and possibly other NATO countries. If the, if the Israelis can do this, right, does it mean that... You know, we are anyways insulated. Can you imagine a situation like that 10 years back? I wouldn't be. I wouldn't ever imagine that to happen. But that's happened today. So it's a new world order that we are in. Admit it. Countries can deny you stuff. Countries can deny you a pin that goes into your rifle. And that pin could be the difference between losing a soldier and killing the enemy. Right? And, and fine, you know, it might be hard to believe, but I've seen plenty of instances where something which is very small in a weapon causes you more trouble because we've gone through the pains of developing something and failing because of something which is as small as a pin or a spring. You know, the answer to your question, uh, um, and allow me to answer it from, a, you know, from an academic point of view, is that the truth is, if you look at the history of conflict, no country has ever risen on the basis of weapons bought from somewhere else. It's not possible. Certainly a country the size and, of India and the ambitions of India as a rising power, to believe that we will rise you know, to our rightful place in the Committee of Nations based on weapons purchased from someone else, it's not possible. You cannot become powerful on food bought from somewhere else and weapons bought from somewhere else. It cannot happen. It's impossible. The people who understand this very clearly are the Chinese, right? The Chinese are so hellbent and have been so hellbent for so many years in really developing the indigenous defense 
industry because they know that a country of their size, of China's size, cannot rise in the world unless it makes its own weapons. So this is very, so what you're saying is absolutely critical. I have one last point to you. Uh, You know, I recently saw some reports, which was really interesting, that India's defense indigenization is tied to the U.S. in the sense that actually U.S. has become India's biggest importer of defense equipment. So I believe, I, I, I suspect these are parts of, this is part of some supply chain, and we are supplying a lot of parts to the U.S., uh, what do you think about that? And do companies like you hope to, you know, be this kind of behemoth that supplies parts and actually make India a supplier, net supplier, rather than net purchaser? Hindu, you know, devil lies in the details, right? Uh, so the first question that one should be asking is, if the US is a net importer of defense Parts and components from India. What are those? Not net importer. Are? Not net importer. Is the biggest importer of the exports in defense that we are doing. So, so let me understand your question right. Uh, what you're saying is of that the defense equipment that India is producing, the biggest buyer is America. Of the defense equipment that India is producing. Okay, fine. But then it's manufactured. The whatever is indigenous being manufactured in whatever shape and form, full weapons, parts, whatever it is. Uh, so the, components, answer question, yeah. the answer to the question is we don't sell full weapons. We don't sell full weapons. That's right. Let's be very That's clear right. about this. Yeah. And, 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 and if someone kind of comes back and then cites this particular statistic to you, uh, well, yes, it is good that we're doing that. Right? Is that good enough is what I would say. Okay? Uh, for example, the South Koreans have developed their own industry over the course of time. And that was an industry which they developed bits and pieces They've got their own small arms, they've got their own rifles, they've got their own medium caliber weapons, they've got their own aircraft at this point in time, uh, they've got their own tanks. Um, and, and understand this, South Koreans are, uh, are, are a country that is worth emulating because unlike the Chinese, the South Koreans did not resort to rampant theft. Right? The, the Chinese built up most of what they have today by pure rampant theft. And the Americans have actually come out into the open and said that the biggest theft that has ever had Ever, ever been, uh, you know, on, on us is through the Chinese theft of blueprints of everything from tanks to weapons to, uh, you know, uh, critical uh, technologies, platforms. That's what I'm talking about. Um, South Korea is also important, Vivek. I'm glad you mentioned South Korea because South Korea is really under the U.S.'s security umbrella in a way that India never will and never should be. You know, that's a very different relationship. India is an independent, you know, we we really treasure our sovereignty. We really treasure our independence in geostrategic affairs. You know, we have strategic autonomy. South Korea really does not in many ways. And if South Korea too is building its own armaments, it's very, very interesting. Right. And and you realize this one thing, that South Koreans are actually not selling to the rest of the world parts and components. They're actually selling whole weapon systems including to India, right? Now, the fact is this, when you move away from being a supplier of components to a supplier of whole weapon systems, you preserve leverage. It's easy for anyone to move away from components. At least it should be easy to move away from somebody who's a supplier of components. The Americans will slowly start moving away from the Chinese on several supplies of components, be that for the stealth fighters, be that for the uh, you know, for, 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 for uh, hardware. Uh, but once you've actually bought full weapon this systems... Is the, but this is probably the gap we're also trying to fill, Vivek. I mean, it's a China plus, what is known as a China plus strategy in FDI, Absolutely. right? I mean, the Americans want to move away from China. Indians can sell some of the components that Chinese need. You can sell some of the components. Now, I go back to this particular uh, point that you mentioned about the the Americans actually being... Uh, buyers of a lot of components from our side. Now, just understand this. One of the largest suppliers of components, very, very good firm based in Bangalore, is today one of the largest suppliers of components, not of the U.S. defense industry, but to the U.S. firearms industry. Of course, yes, it gets classified as defense because the end product is a weapon, but it is actually the U.S. civilian firearms industry. It is not the U.S. Department of Defense. 
Very, very, very good point. I think that's an excellent point. And especially about the US, this is really worth underlining. Excellent point. Yeah. So it's not exactly the US Department of Defense or Department of Defense related companies and contractors who are buying this. It's a very large supply to the US civilian firearms market. And this company is doing brilliantly. Amazing company all said and done. Uh, but I'm still coming back to this point. You can supply components to a lot of people. In fact, I'd be happy to supply accessories, small components, uh, you know, everything from bolt carrier groups for my weapon systems, which we've almost built on NATO platforms to the US civilian firearms market and make a lot of money because it's a good market to kind of, you know, uh, tidy through those ups and downs that you might see as far as defense procurements are concerned. But I would still want to kind of look at triplus defense and maybe I would love to see many other companies also coming up in this space who have the ability to transition from R&D all the way to testing and certification and sales. Because there is no way that we as a country with such a large population, such a volatile neighborhood can do with maybe one or two OEMs. It's impossible for us to do that. Tomorrow, if you have war, let's face it, it's war gaming that we do, right? It's, if you're in the defense business, you actually have to start thinking about what's going to happen when conflict emerges. If conflict emerges, what is it that we're going to be doing? Are we going to be fighting the next battle with incest rifles? Or are we going to be going across and then asking for the US, find me all the weapons which you have in your armory and give it to us? Just so you know, when October 7th happened in 2023, I have a whole lot of people in the US firearms business. All that they did for the next six months was sell, sell, sell to Israel. This is a country which has its own armaments industry and yet it was buying all forms of parts, kits from the US to kit its own soldiers and its reserves. This is Israel, right? Fine, you could say they don't have a very large army, but for God's sake, they needed the support of a foreign power at that point in time to kit their own soldiers and give them guns because for the most part, those people were all in reserves and you suddenly you got a whole lot of reserves, almost about 100,000 people who did not have weapons in their hands. We have a much more volatile neighborhood, if not more volatile than the Israelis, and yet we are resisting the, uh, you know, the, the full out. I'm, I'm not saying we're resisting. I'm saying we've, we're not going full out. I say, you know, this whole idea, if you can send a man, don't send a boy. You know, this whole idea of this, this idea is basically that if you want to go hammer and pounds, go full out. Don't be, you know, don't hide behind things like, hey, it's got to be calibrated. No, this will create other issues for us. There's got to be a first time to everything. You've got to go out there and say, hey, listen, I'm going to be trying to work on a system whereby we've got a bunch of mad scientists who will work with a bunch of industry guys. Let's figure out what's going to be the best for us. Put out the best possible rifles. Maybe we don't acquire 70,000. Maybe we acquire 10,000. But what happens in the course of that 10,000? You create the platform for industries and firms to thrive. They actually start giving you the next round of evolutions. Maybe five years down the line, we would have an industry which is even better than Korea. right? But what happens is that that small spark, which is basically to say, I trust you, let's go out and do small stuff, may not be the big bank procurements, but procurements which will actually see the light of day and get us to understand what we have and what can be sustained for the next 10 years is the reason why we would be able to fight a war whenever it comes. It can come in any time, let's face it. Fascinating. Uh, I want to conclude by asking you one last question. Uh, you know, one of the points you made in the Twitter thread that you wrote a bunch of posts that you wrote is that well we are not going to give up okay this this order didn't happen or whatever there are there's enough happening even in our in the indian subcontinent and we will be the suppliers net suppliers to many many people including many other countries you know in this neighborhood and we really you know bank on that explain to a little bit more on that to us so first of all people think that i'm aghast. I'm angry at the fact that we didn't get this contract. I am not. I would be angry if I flunked this whole test because that is something that is reflective of my inability, right? So I'm not angry at all. Let's face it. We knew that this particular order was going to happen. The reason I put out this tweet is so that we know from that we've done whatever we've got to do. We did whatever we had to do. Going forward, this whole doctrine of outsourcing your uh, 
uh, your, your, your defense industry, even if it is firearms, somebody else is not a prudent idea has to be ingrained. I don't believe here that all battles can be fought purely between the forces and industry. I also believe here that we have a collective conscience in this country, collective conscience of people who have the ability to put their ideas, collective conscience of people who are tomorrow going to be sending the kids to fight a war, maybe, or have to participate in the conflict, collective conscience of a whole bunch of people who want India to thrive. If that conscience is basically going to also spur this movement towards getting more indigenous, then so be it. Let it happen today. Let this not be something where we say fine to a foreign purchase or we say fine, the foreign purchase did not happen. I should have got it. I never said I should have got it. All I said is fine. Sig has got this particular order, but that does not stop me from making the same weapon as what Sig would make and hope that tomorrow, as and when the Indian army wants to have something to fight a battle or to go into a conflict or to kind of expand its capabilities, I am there for them with the same weapon, chambered for the same round, perhaps a better one than what they've bought. So my whole perspective then and continues to be the same and will always remain the same. We've got to be better than the rest of the world in many areas. I believe in firearms. We have a very good chance of being better than the rest of the world. Fine. We're going to go through those hiccups. We're going to go through those pines when things don't work. It's, it's part and parcel of business. It's risk that you take. You take certain steps to mitigate those risks, yet you will have failures. You've got to come back on the horse to correct those failures. This is how it's got to happen. There's nothing which is perfect for anybody. But if you can do that, then we would have done our job. One, as an entrepreneurial company, two, as someone who is intrinsically involved in national security. I hold that position. I will not change that position. We will continue to remain in this business. We will continue to serve whatever we've got to serve. And we want to be global. And being global does not mean at any point in time that we are going to be cribbing about what the Indian army is bought. I will still not say that the Sikh purchase was a bad purchase. They did what they had to do. I am firmly of the view that the next round of purchases or the next round of acquisitions in the small arms business has to be calibrated, has to be thought through. Indian industry, be it us, be it somebody else, has to not be given a chance. Chances, forget, we don't ask for chances anymore. We say, involve us. Right? You want 10 weapons, we'll give you 10 weapons. Go, take them into missions, see what happens. Right? I'm not asking for 100,000 weapons at all. I'm saying I'll give you a thousand weapons. See what happens to those thousand weapons. One, you get feedback from your mission. You get feedback from your soldiers. We get feedback from whatever those soldiers have to say. We get to make a better weapon. At some point in time, maybe, you know, this entire special forces community would want to kind of hold on to this particular weapon for particular missions of theirs. It's not a billion dollar purchase any which way. Right? But it's going to keep you away from that point in time when you have nobody else to go to because you've not built up your Indian ecosystem and military industrial complex. Important. I think you've made some excellent points, Vivek. And I think many, many people, not just within the you know broad security uh, industry and the universe, but many people who think carefully about India's sovereignty and its security must listen to what you have to say. Thank you very much for spending time and talking to me. Thanks for having me.